Hey Marty, yeah, this is Perry from Perry Curville Alive. I'm here to inform you and to tell you your podcast is a piece of shit. Okay? Secret Society of Fly Tigers? What in the fuck is that? Fly Tigers. It's not even a baseball game or a I mean a baseball team or a football team, Fly Tigers. You're 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 the name of your podcast is moronic. Your podcast is stupid. Why do you even do this dumb thing? And you're obsessed with leeches? Are are, are you uh, uh, an exterminator or something? And if you are, why why would somebody care about something so moronic like that, huh? Nobody's going to listen to a podcast with that stuff. I, I would never put on your podcast to listen to your moronic podcast never in a million years get out of the business because you're not a businessman and you're not even giving out your real name you bimbo give out your real name so let's let's uh, find out who you really are piece of trash so so the secret society of fly tigers is stupid and a piece of trash, get off the air, good day. Hi everybody, and a very pleasant Wednesday to you, wherever you may be. Hi everybody, and a very pleasant Tuesday evening to you, wherever you may be. And a very pleasant evening to you, wherever you may be. Down here, we would greet you by saying good day, mate. It's time for... Secret Society of Flight Tires. Well, you can't please everyone. The Secret Society of Fly Tigers does have a nice ring to it, though. If you know who that was in the intro, congratulations. And if you're aware of Vin Scully and you don't love him, there might be something seriously wrong with you. Allegiance to a team or a city isn't a good enough excuse either. He was almost like the voice of God to me, if I'm going to be real. I will be real. I am real. Vin was really important to people all over the world, but even more important to baseball fans in LA. I'm stoked to be able to write about a river that flows through a city that I think I love even though it's filthy and weird. Anyways, we'll get to that stuff. It's me, Milton. Milton! I'm still here as your host. I feel more like a narrator, but titles have never mattered much to me. My essence cannot be labeled? Why must you label me? My essence has no label! I'm lying already. I very much care about my children being able to tell their friends that their dad is the president of the digital audio fish lure crafting community. Every once in a while, the listener analytics from countries with literally no podcast competition proves that true. And for a few hours, I feel so powerful. So powerful. Whoa. So, we made it to the 22nd episode of Secret Society of Fly Tires. There's a small personal set of synchronicities there for me because I'm a Dodger fan and 22 is the number worn by one of the greatest pitchers of all time, Clayton Kershaw. And this episode is about the LA River. It was all meant to be. And thanks for downloading me into your life today. Where'd you download that sandwich? (laughs) We live in a strange time. I piece these shows together over a few days or sometimes weeks and upload them to the internet. Then they end up in your ears or your cars or whatever. It all happens pretty quick too. That is, after I'm done with all the backbreaking labor and mental flexing and I pay all the podcasting bills for each of these one to two hour episodes, it's a true marvel of human perseverance and technology. Technology, what is that all about? Is it good or is it whack? Not really. It's just me blabbing into a mic connected to my computer and my Toyota sedan. I'm honestly still surprised that there's people besides my friends that listen, let alone enjoy this borderline psychotic show that's supposed to be about fly tying. This season specifically has been just as much about my weird daydream scenarios or embarrassing real stories from my past as it has been about fly tying. I do have plans for some more fly pattern specific episodes that I'm looking forward to. Hopefully those will appease whoever left the sole one star review on my show on Apple. I bet it was an angry Freemason actually. That's what I'm gonna make myself think. Of course you would think something like that, Milton. I've got a couple saltwater episodes on my mind too. I also want to do one just about tubes. Season 2 is winding down, so we'll see what I have time to get to and what will get pushed over to Season 3. I've been looking forward to this episode for a long time. 
Not just because it took me a while for my schedule and my guest schedule to line up. It's been high on my list of episode ideas since I started the podcast. Episode 22 is all about the LA River, and Fernando Vasquez is going to be our virtual guide. I first became aware of Fernando in a short article from Filson called The Punk Rockers of Fly Fishing, Angling on the LA River, and I had set out to talk to him and learn more. Fernando is a member of the American Carp Society, and he also put together all the Carp on the Fly content for the American Carp Society's website. Does that make him a webmaster? He might be one of the only Carp webmasters. He's Urban Carp Guy, all one word, on Instagram, and he posts some great content. He catches carp using tackle of all types, too. I think he likes carp. It's not the carp's fault that they're a strong fish and have been able to survive and thrive in aquatic ecosystems that we humans have poisoned and destroyed. He's been busy with a heavy load of schoolwork lately, but found some time to yap with me, and I'm very thankful. It's a fourth synchronicity that he shares a name with the pitcher that made my family Dodger fans in the early 80s. These little things might seem inconsequential to you, but when a few of them pile up, I try to follow that trail, and I haven't been disappointed yet. Life is strange. The LA River sounds like a strange place to find a fly angler. Your Toyota sedan sounds like a strange place for a fly angler. I'd bet there's a lot of people out there that wouldn't even believe there's a river in LA, and they'd be wrong, but it's a pretty unique fishery and has gone through many changes. It's definitely a river with fish in it, amongst other things, but it probably doesn't match up with the images that flash through your head when you think about fly fishing. Here are just a few of the potentially hazardous items one might come across while fishing in the Los Angeles River. Needles, broken bottles, shopping carts, car batteries, sex toys, spoiled meat, wet fish, unexploded ordinances, bees, more needles, cow traps, f***ing wet stupid shit, bones, lizard tails, medical waste, pornographic content, unidentifiable eggs, and human grease. I guess I thought of it naively as a completely man-made water system that supported the giant city of Los Angeles in different ways. But come to find out, there's a pretty lengthy history to the LA River. Let me relay a quick rundown of what I learned. The LA River was originally an alluvial river that ran freely across a floodplain that is now occupied by Los Angeles, Long Beach, and other townships in Southern California. Its path was unstable and unpredictable, and the mouth of the river moved frequently from one place to another between Long Beach and Bologna Creek. Floods damaged extensive amounts of farmland, destroying houses and killing people and livestock. Severe flooding encouraged those living near the river to adapt and construct further away from the river in order to prevent loss from flooding. In the early 19th century, the river turned southwest after leaving the Glendale Narrows where it joined Bologna Creek and discharged into Santa Monica Bay in present Marina Del Rey. The river was long joined by the San Gabriel River in present day Long Beach, but in the Great Flood of 1862, the San Gabriel carved out a new course six miles to the east and has discharged into Alamitos Bay ever since. The arrival of the railroad accelerated the advancement in urbanization as various government bodies subdued the river by reducing its flow. Until the 1900s, the river was known to supply enough water to incorporate a system of wells to be built in order to supply fresh water to the city. I'm not sure how this lines up with Tartarian theories, but I'm sure the real powers that be are fudging some dates in there somewhere for their gain. I want to look at some ruins in America. Recently, we will have looked at the ruins of Chicago, and by now I think we've looked at the ruins almost everywhere. In my opinion, this is the most fascinating research in the world right now. The heavy flow of the Los Angeles River presented many issues as it began to get exploited as a sewer system. Along with these uses, populations surrounding the river often tossed feces and waste into the river, along with dead dogs and horses, and occasionally human dead, all in hopes that they would get washed downstream and released to the open ocean waters. Sometime after that, the Los Angeles aqueduct system opened and altered some things. And even though the history started getting a little crazy right there, I'm still getting bored of it, so let's stop and fast forward a little bit. Prior to the 1930s, the LA River was home to native rainbow trout and even seasonal runs of steelhead and chinook salmon. The Los Angeles River was, in fact, a trout stream. Then, in 1938, the Army Corps of Engineers began a nearly 20-year process of channelizing the river, encasing its banks in concrete in an effort to control flooding. Then, Rockstar Games made Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, and the rest is history. Go, fool, out! Don't you know what road rage is? 
It's a similar situation to the water I talked about with Chris Bear from AZ Fly Shop on the Phoenix Canals episode. Real Metro fly fishing. Maybe you don't even need waders. Or actually you do need waders because that gave me an idea for my non-existent e-commerce store. A brand of waders specifically made for Metro fishing that are super lightweight and packable but also hazmat grade and come with a bunch of add-on pieces like full helmet, elbow length gloves, air filtration, needle proof soles for the boots and you get the idea. This is a joke about there being hazardous substances and objects in Metro rivers. I'm exaggerating obviously, but I really hate littering guys. Yeah, that was me, giving you a big old guilt trip for littering. I really hope it worked and that you haven't littered since the last time I talked to you, or you're in big trouble. And LA is full of garbage in many ways, literally, figuratively, symbolically, and spiritually. But I love it for many reasons. I was born in Southern California and spent a lot of time in LA playing music, working in music, going to ball games, and eating lots of great food. I ate what still stands as the best burger I've ever eaten in my life in LA at Chef Ludo's Petit Trois. Petit Trois? Petit Trois? It doesn't matter how I pronounce the place. It's so good it's almost criminal. And Chef Ludo's burger is barely a burger because it's like a fine dining burger, not one you get at a barbecue or at a drive through But holy shit, was it good. My buddy Matt and I have eaten a lot of good food together. And we split plates like we're an old married couple because we want to taste as many flavors as possible. Is that weird? I don't care. I don't think he does either. The day we went to get that burger, we decided to also get an omelet because that's what you do at French restaurants. I'm not sure I've eaten a lunch more rich than that one. We were in town for work and had to hightail it back to our office in Culver City, and the combo of those rich lunch plates and a herky-jerky Uber driver in moderate LA traffic hurt my tummy. I didn't poop my pants this time, but I did barf up that delicious expensive burger all over the street in front of a Starbucks and an Uber driver that was very thankful my puke didn't end up in her car. It's the only time I've ever thrown anything up and wanted to go back to the restaurant to eat the meal again. Okay, is that weird? There is a ton of weird LA lore. There's so much I kind of don't know what to write about first. We all know it's basically the headquarters of the Illuminati, right? Yes, of course, Marty. I have never heard something more obvious. Or maybe the marketing arm of the octopus at the very least. I mean, the courtyard below the Creative Artist Agency's tower in Los Angeles is a pretty blatant all-seeing eye. That's just a bunch of evil occult landscaping, though. Below the landscape of Los Angeles is rumored to be a giant underground maze of catacombs. LA Mag dug into it in an article from 2014. Allow me to read it to you. One of the most colorful urban legends of LA is that of the Lizard People, an advanced race of humanoids who are said to have created an underground city under LA some 5,000 years ago. According to the story, incalculable riches and gold tablets with the origins of human civilization carved into them were just waiting to be discovered by some savvy treasure hunter. Wait, is this a long Mormon joke or something? This super race, allegedly related to the Mayans, had purportedly fled a catastrophic meteor shower and created several such communities along the west coast, including the one in the Los Angeles basin. The so-called lizard people were so intellectually and technologically advanced that they edited their podcasts with only their minds and used mysterious chemicals to dig a network of some 285 tunnels fully equipped with vast chambers large enough to accommodate a thousand families who lived off of a store of food and water placed there by the tribe. This story, loosely drawn from a Hopi Indian myth by a tribesman called Chief Greenleaf, hell yeah, was told to a geophysicist and mining engineer named George Warren Schufelt in 1933. As you guys know, (coughs) or this may be news to you, putting something in the bowl and my mind just thinks all different types of ways, man. As it turned out, Schufelt had invented what he called a radio x-ray machine, which he believed could detect underground tunnels. Add to that the promise of an ancient sheepskin map held by two other treasure hunters, and you have a tale that went viral by 1933 standards. If there aren't lizards under LA, then the Illuminati is definitely using those tunnels to silently move the people they hold captive as adrenochrome factories to different elite locations. Don't try to convince me otherwise. George Warren later went on to refer to himself as G. Warren. Is that where LA rapper Warren G. got his name? Are the West Coast rappers into Illuminati shit like the East Coast rappers are? Probably not. Warren G's name is Warren Griffin, 
And that's the first piece of hip hop trivia on Secret Society of Fly Tires. Let's crawl deeper down the rabbit hole into more LA weirdness and head slightly northeast to Pasadena where Jack Parsons and a few other Caltech students started Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is now owned by NASA. Jack Parsons was also instrumental in the start of Aerojet that has presence out here near me in Northern Cal and Rancho Cordova. He was one of the most influential figures in the history of the American space program. He was also deep into the occult and the supernatural and was buddies with Aleister Crowley and L. Ron Hubbard. Jack and his wife Helen were members of the Order Templi Orientis, which is a hub for Aleister Crowley's spiritual and religious philosophy, Thelema, a sprawling esoteric movement that incorporates ancient Egyptian deities, sex rituals, and lots of other mystic practices slanted towards the dark side of things. It swept up some prominent names over the years. The more I read into it, the more I learn that Crowley and Thelema have been percolating in Hollywood for decades. And it seems to be enjoying some type of resurgent popularity if you pay attention to mainstream pop culture. Maybe it never went away. The backbone of Crowley's ideas were rooted in the belief that Lucifer is the true god of our realm, the light bearer. Just like I started telling you a few episodes back about the 33rd degree of Freemasons. I've tried to explain to you that all this stuff is connected. I am not going crazy. Anyways, another main focus of Thelema was to achieve a higher state of existence by embracing one's true will or ultimate purpose beyond selfishness or ego. Jack incorporated these ideas into his life and performed ritual magic regularly, while also furthering our collective knowledge on rocket science. Thelema was consuming Parsons' brain. At one point, he was basically forced to choose between his dedication to this occult craze or pursuing his degree at USC. He dropped out of school and dove deeper into Thelema and donated most of his salary to the Ordo Templi Orientis. His involvement with the OTO eventually cost him his career. I could probably write an hour just about how much wild occult shit Parsons was into, and that NASA still seems to adhere to some occult ritual practices related to the dates of their launches and much more. Dark Mission, The Secret History of NASA is a very thick but really good read. Have you ever heard of a homunculus? Google that one and throw in terms like Aleister Crowley and Ritual Magic with a K on the end and maybe Babylon Workings and you'll see that Parsons was trying to birth some type of moon child and he may have succeeded. Or maybe don't Google those things unless you don't mind being on the same watch list as me. Just ask Jack's late wife Marjorie Cameron. I'm sure her ghost can be summoned. Hands vermilion. Start of fire. Right cotillion. Ravens die. Parsons accidentally blew himself up, by the way. Spoiler alert. Speaking of blowing things up, there are even rumors that the US government did some type of magic ritual during test detonations of nuclear bombs at the Trinity site, with what people say was some type of humunculus in a giant metal container. That is one of the weirder things that I've come across in my personal conspiracy research. It's hard to believe, but it's starting to look more realistic and factual than Martians crashing here on Earth after traveling across space and then you read about Aleister Crowley and how he said he used ritual magic to communicate with some kind of interdimensional entity named Lamb, which per Crowley's description is one of the earlier experiences with a being that looks like your classic gray alien. I keep sounding crazier as this long sentence gets longer, but I just fucking told you it was all connected and I'll let you research the rest yourself if you care to. I hope I taught you the word homunculus today because I just learned it earlier this year and it's led to some fun reading. But the Trinity site is not in Los Angeles. It has nothing to do with flies or fly fishing either. There's so much in LA to cover. There are many flies that you could use to catch carp on the LA River too. I've talked about carp with a couple guests now and when I ask them what flies they like to use, they all have different answers. I'm interested to find out what Fernando likes to use. It seems to be more about getting the fish's attention than anything else. You probably don't need to match the hatch as they say. I'll admit that I've never caught a carp on the fly, so this is information that I'm finding and relaying to you, but I'm very happy to report that a commonly used pattern is my special favorite, the leech. Ah, uh, the leech. What are leeches anyway? This is a leech. Feels good to press those buttons again. It's been a while. People say carp like egg patterns too. Fucking throw those two together into the hard to beat egg sucking leech, why don't you? Some people try to tie stuff they don't think carp in their area have seen before just to get their interest. Others like to use some more subdued, natural-looking patterns. I'm learning that it's hard to get a carp to eat, and your presentation is very important. That's usually a key for fly fishing. It's a cliché, but it seems to really ring true for carp. Just tie up a fly that looks like a piece of corn, or a hot dog, or a piece of chewed-up bubblegum. The carp won't be able to resist. 
People say carp aren't good eating, but if they eat corn and hot dogs all the time, I bet the people that are saying that are lying and trying to hoard all that delicious carp meat for themselves. They know the meat laws in our country are changing soon, and they don't want to eat bugs. I'd eat carp before bugs, unless it meant I wouldn't have to go to work anymore for the rest of my life, in which case I already told you I'd gladly hork down a handful of worms or any other bug for that matter. Maybe not spiders. All jokes aside, carp are said to be the smartest species of fish, and they won't be fooled easily. That's why anglers lose their shit over them. There's a lot of appeal to the challenge and punishment of trying to catch one, and I bet it feels pretty good to crack that code and find success. You may or may not be surprised to hear that there have been a handful of cases of carp aquarium owners teaching their fish to speak, similar to the way a parrot will mimic its owner. What's the matter? I don't want you to bite me. No. I'm not going to hurt you. Come on. Wait. That's why. See? You, you scared me. You tried to hurt me. That isn't true but a talking fish still wouldn't register very high on the weird scale if the fish lived in LA. Yeah, LA is weird. It's one of the best at being weird. I know I spent most of the episode going on and on about Crowley and Jack Parsons, but that story is so full of crazy shit I could keep typing until I blew up like Jack did. Please oh please, don't blow up, Matty boy. I can't end the monologue without making sure that you all know that LA also has the best French dip sandwich in the world at Philippe's. They invented it, and I'll be mad at you if you've never had one and go to LA without changing that. It's a cool old building too, that is absolutely haunted by ghosts that want to continue eating French dips for the rest of their ghostly existence. The bread and the au jus for you. You can order a single dip, a double dip, and if you really want a lot of flavor, you can ask for it wet and they'll really dunk it. A lot of flavor, but a little messy. Go eat a wet sandwich there as soon as possible. Make it even more wet with their delicious hot mustard. And go get a wet fish in the LA River. I dare you. Try something different. I tried something different with this episode. I found a guest that isn't a professional fishing guide and doesn't tie flies, yet. He's just an angler that loves to fish and loves carp so much he joined a carp society. His name is Fernando Vasquez, and he's gonna teach us what we need to know about fishing the LA River. Let's get into it, dude. So, Fernando, thanks for coming on the program, dude. Yeah, thanks to you for inviting me. Yeah. This is great. It took us a little while to find a good date and time for this. I'm glad we yeah. finally did, and I'm stoked to learn more about you and the L.A. River. I read a Filson article a while back. Okay. It was, it was pretty short, but it was pretty surprising to me and impactful, and it had some nice photos to go along with it, too. And at that point in my life, I had no idea that anyone even fished the L.A. River, uh, you know, and it sent me down the rabbit hole, which brings us to today. There was a pic- couple pictures of you in that in that mm. article. And um, anyway, are you, are you born and raised down in L.A.? Uh, I was born in Pasadena, uh, when I was little, my mom didn't really like it here. So she moved back to Mexico with her family. My dad stayed here. So I grew up in Mexico. I came back here when basically at the beginning of high school. So I came back, did high school, got out of high school, went to community college. And after that, I transferred to the college that I'm in right now. So half my life was spent in Mexico. And so far right now, the other half is here. And this is where I picked up fishing pretty much, yeah. I used to fish when I was little in Mexico, but it wasn't anything intense. It was just like once a month, maybe once every two months. Yeah. But well, that was, here it's like a weekly thing for me. Is it? Is it? Yeah, that, that was my, my next question. Like, when did you start? You know, when did you get into fly fishing? Like, when did, you know, I know you throw any kind of stuff out there, right? And when, yeah. did, the, when did the fly stuff come into the equation? Uh, fly fishing, um, I used to fish. Sometimes I'll fish with him. Uh, a good friend of mine, his name is Tony. Uh, he got me into fly fishing probably when I was in high school. I don't really remember the year exactly, but it was like a very casual thing. Every once in a while when he brought his fly rod, I would give it a try, catch a few bluegill. And I always thought it was fun. I think, yeah, it was right after high school. So I think 2015 or 16, that's when I bought my first fly rod, gave it a try, couldn't pick it up. I was very, it, it was, it was really tough for me just to get into it. So I put it aside for like a whole year, probably like a year and a half. Yeah. And then out of nowhere after that, I think I went to the Pasadena casting pond here, here in Pasadena. And I met a few cool people. They, they gave me some tricks. They taught me how to cast it better. And clear, after clear. that, I just picked it up pretty quick. Yeah. They clear some stuff up. Yeah. 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 You, you can develop bad habits on the 
yeah, in the process. Absolutely. So, and you have a bunch of misconceptions about fly fishing before you do it. You know, like you yeah. think th there's reasons for certain things and, and stuff that you're just totally in the dark on until you talk to somebody who actually knows what they're talking about. And, yeah. or, you know, like now watch it on YouTube or something, at least get the beginning, you yeah. know, the, the start of it. Um, but you fish, you're fishing a lot. Yeah. 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 I fish when I can. Uh, if I have a couple of hours free time, I'll just drive to some pond, some lake here in the city and just go for whatever. If there's bluegill, that's fun. If there's bass cool if there's carp then i'm into the challenge so, <laughs> have you uh have you got into surf fishing at all i've given it a try a couple of times i live pretty far from the beach so it's not as accessible but yeah. i gave it a try a couple of times and it was it was fun but i'm nowhere near as good as i would like to be it's a whole different thing it is right it's like it's... reading the waves and like going yeah. back and forth shooting the line out there past where the break the waves break so yeah yeah it's a totally different world i love it too i haven't done it a whole lot myself but every time i get out there i'm like oh man i got i gotta do it more so it's fun though it's how, fun. so how often are you fishing the la river then uh you know if you're fishing once a week is it is that a typical stop yeah so it depends with with the amount of work i have to do here at school but if i have time that's usually my priority just to go to some pond or lake i prefer the la river for many reasons there's plenty of spots to fish and it's always like an adventure. You never know what you're going to run into. Man, you're just piquing my curiosity even more. So, yeah. so let's, I guess let's start like at the basics. Like, how did you, how did you find out about fishing the LA river? Like, you know, where, where did that start? I think when I started fly fishing after the whole period where I, I hated fly fishing and then I gave it a try and then oh. I fell in love with it. That's when yeah. I started looking up places to fish in LA. Did you, did you hate did you hate it because you're having a hard time with it or was yeah there something at first on it? All right. yeah at first i hated it because of that like i just couldn't get it done and put it aside for a while sure yeah uh, but when i got back into it i think i found a video of these these guys fly fishing the river i don't i don't remember their names or anything it's like one of those really old videos and i used to live in glendale i lived in glendale nine years and the river goes through glendale right next to glendale so i realized like this place is like 10 minutes away from my house. I should be fishing there. It's accessible. Right. Yeah. So I started going there before and after work when I was working uh, in Pasadena. So I would, if I had a late night shift and I would just go in the afternoon, fish there for like an hour or two. If I would get off early, then I would just go. Same thing. And that's how I got my first carp one day, just after work. The sun is going down. I see a carp. I threw a backstabber. It just went right after it, crushed it. Landed my first carp. It was probably like four or five pounds. Nothing big, but it was Sweet. really fun. Yeah. So that's how I got started. Way cool, man. Yeah, well, I guess let's talk about the kind of fish that are in there. We know carp already. Is there is there uh, different kinds of carp in there? And what what else could you find? Uh, there is common carp. Uh, you'll you'll run into some common, I mean, some mirror carp, huh. but it's kind of rare. There's some bass, sunfish, all kinds of bluegills, basically. There's some tilapia. I've never caught one, but I've seen Crazy. them. Crazy. Uh, there's a lot of, um, what are those catfish called? The little ones, they have like a big belly. Uh, I think they're bullhead catfish. How are tilapia getting in there? How are there tilapia? Yeah, how are they getting in there? I'm not sure. They, man, I gotta I, do, I gotta look some stuff up here, man. Yeah, yeah, they're they're always there, but they're so, they, they get spooked easily. Like the moment you walk near, near them, they just like scatter all over the place. Crazy. And I've never been able to catch one. I don't know what they feed them. Maybe that's like the new LA River trophy, man. You get a tilapia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that would be interesting, honestly, yeah. just because they're so hard to catch. You always yeah. see them, but you just never go after them. They're pretty small, but they're very interesting fish. Yeah, I wonder. If, I wonder if they're used for some reason of, uh, you know, in some sort of maintenance aspect of the of the LA River system. Like if they're doing something to clean the water or something like that. I'm just, I'm just, my, I'm just thinking. I have, I have no clue. Man, I want to. I want to look up. I want to find out how tilapia are getting in there. I'm curious. Now. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna look. Oh, so would, is is mirror carp? Is that like a big? Is that a big deal if you catch a mirror carp? In yeah, they're pretty rare. That's like yeah. the trophy of carp yeah. in there. That's cool. Yeah. You, uh, you get some uh, what we call the linear mirror carp with the single line of scales on their side. Way cool. And then we get the fully scaled mirrors, which is just like big scales, crazy patterns on their sides, but they're fully yeah, scaled the, the the mirror carp look wild i've, I've seen pictures yeah. of those i'm not sure i've seen the single the single one you're talking about they're out there i've seen them never caught one up. yeah they're cool 
So what kind of flies then do people typically use on the river? What do you like using? I actually brought the flies oh, cool. just to remember what I throw out there because it varies depending you, on the time of the year. Yeah, you're not the first person I've asked about this stuff with carp. And it seems like I hear different, completely different stuff from everybody. Right. Can I see that box again? I know people aren't going to see it on on the show here, but yeah, it varies pretty wild too. Yeah. All kinds of stuff. Yeah. So the way I like to have my flies, basically on one side, I have all these leeches and crawfish patterns like crawdads. Those are fun to use. Whenever you use something that mimics a bug, mm. carp tend to crush it really hard. Is there, but, crawd, is there crawdads in the LA River too? Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of them out yeah. there. Yeah, you really don't see them often, but when you go to the rocky areas, if you flip a rock, you'll see a couple. Yeah. And they can get pretty big. I don't know how much nutritional value crawfish have for carp, but they eat them for sure. They crunch them up anyway. Yeah, yeah they just go after them. <laughs> and the other type of flies are like eggs, you know, salmon eggs and yeah. things that look kind of muzzy or like things that are not buggy. Mm-hmm. Uh, mob flies, I guess that would that would be considered kind of like a bug, I guess. But they tend to hit those pretty often. I've noticed they don't really crush them as hard as if it was a leech or something. They don't really chase them. You kind of have to put them right in front of them sometimes. Usually those two things, just egg patterns, something that looks kind of like like a little piece of moss or something, or like a worm. They, they feed on that stuff pretty su- often. Super interesting to me. I I know as soon as I get my first one on the fly like i'm gonna probably lose my shit over it it just seems like like how do, is it just a confidence thing like what you d- decide to to pick if you're gonna be fly fishing <clears throat> for them or is there are you really trying to match a hatch it's not really like matching the hatch out there yeah sometimes i'll throw something very vibrant in color a lot of the times i like to throw like really bright colors uh chartreuse or green colors pink colors for some reason they like that so one thing that i've noticed about carp they're not so picky, at least at the LA River, they're not so picky about eating something that is totally new to them. I think it's just more about the presentation because mm-hmm. they they can be very spooky also. Uh, the moment they see you, they just leave and they won't come back until an hour or two later. That's what I hear too. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, are you always, if you're fishing the LA River, are you targeting carp or you ever go down there for other, for other stuff? Always carp. Yeah. But occasionally you'll see a bass just cruising around. They're not mm-hmm. that big. Um, I just caught my biggest one from there two weeks ago, and it's probably like two pounds, maybe. Nice. That's but sometimes cool. you'll see them, and you just switch something real quick and go after it. Most of the times you'll catch it. I just go well prepared for carp all yeah. the time. Does anybody like professionally guide on the LA River? I don't know this as a fact, but I would assume they do because there's people who take people out there almost on a weekly basis oh yeah so i i can assume they do yeah i'm pretty sure there's guys down there that's good that's cool yeah man i i feel like most guys that get into carp fishing like fucking love carp fishing like what is what is it about it that flips the switch for you for me it's the whole process to to get them to bite because they're not easy sometimes most of the time like i was we're teaching a friend of mine how to fly fish and we're trying to get him on his first carp and I can kind of tell he gets frustrated sometimes because it's kind of hard to approach the carp. So I tell him like, this is the, this is where the reward comes. Like you're putting effort, you're learning about the fish. It's not, it's not like bait fishing where you just throw it out there and wait for them to get to your bait. Mm -hmm. You're doing most of the work. You're, you're learning how they behave, the weather, the, the way you cast it, the way you present the fly, all that stuff. So the moment you hook one, at least, for me personally, if I hook one and I lose it, that's fine because I know I'm doing something right. Yeah. And that's very rewarding to me. But you cannot steer away from the fact that they fight pretty good. They, To me, they fight way better than a catfish, a bass, I a see trout, people, if I'm yeah. being honest. I see people with monster carp too, just just like like I, I, I live up in Sacramento and a, a buddy of mine showed me a picture. There's, a, there's some ponds out here in a place called Rancho Marietta. And he had, he had, uh, like it was just both of his arms mm-hmm. full, this gigantic, huge belly on it. I couldn't even tell you how 25 pounds. I don't know. It was huge. That's huge. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, I, yeah. maybe, I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's smaller than that, but it, it looked yeah. huge. They, they got pretty big. Do you like the band carp? The band? Carp with a K. I don't think I've Man, okay. heard it. You gotta look into that. Are you into, you're into metal and stuff though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big yeah. Time. I'll send you a link to carp. You might dig them. 
I always want I always always want to ask people that I fish for carp. Nobody ever does. I, I never heard of it. I'm <laughs> happy okay. you mentioned it. That's great. <laughs> yeah. So have you have you had any sketchy situations out there on the LA River? Not really. It's funny. Well, I'm glad you asked because a lot of people assume that that happens quite often. I know people who have had sketchy situations, but you know what? I've been in one situation only. There is this gang of I would say like little kids in the Glendale area. Uh, there, I think they're like the Frogtown gang. Frogtown is the area. Okay. You know, let's go to our man on the street, Wince Peters, who's live right now from Glendale with one of the members of the Frogtown Gang. Wince, are you there? Thanks, Marty. Reporting live from Glendale, California, I'm Wince Peters, live correspondent for the Secret Society of Fly Tires. And with me today is a man who says he is a member of the Frogtown Gang, who is asked to remain anonymous. We will not be providing his name, but we are able to say with certainty that he is extremely handsome. Sir, thank you for speaking with us today. Could you please tell us why the Frogtown Gang has such a cool name? Richard Frogtown is our leader, and we really like him a lot, and he's really nice and sweet and funny, so we named the gang after him. Great, and what sort of crimes do you think you'll be committing today? I'm not sure. I might toilet paper a house tonight, or me and two friends were thinking about stealing some CDs. We'd buy them, but they have those parental advisory stickers on them, and the clerk at the record store is a real straight shooter, and he won't sell them to us. I'm not blaming him. He's got a job to do. I understand that. But I want those CDs. I'll do whatever it takes to listen to the jerky boys and one final question are you sure that you are not just me with your voice altered to sort of sound like a different person you sound very similar to me but it's just like your voice has been changed a little bit yeah i'm definitely a different person i'm not just you with a voice changer or whatever great thank you for speaking with us well there you have it folks a member of the frogtown gang explains it all in his own words i'm wince peters for the secret society of fly tires back to you in the studio mark so one time I parked my car, it's like a dead end street. And then where the, where the street ends, you just walk a few yards and that's the LA river. So I usually park there and just walk down to a river and fish up and down along the freeway. So one time I noticed they were like on, a, on this like abandoned property. They were just chilling there. So I didn't think much of it. I parked, started walking down. I look back at my car and then they're just walking around my car. Great. So I'm like, okay, they're probably looking into my car. They, they probably want to see what they can get out of it. So I just started walking back to my car and they just took off. That's the only thing that has happened to me. That, that'll um, happen at, at any river spot pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I I know people have found bodies in there. Oh, yeah. one, of, one of the guys that I ran into at the river, he fishes there quite often. He had that experience, which oh, wow. kind of sucks, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess they ran into a corpse down there. Other than that, you, you run into a lot of homeless, but they just don't care about you. At least my personal experience, they're just doing their own thing. They just mind their own business. Yeah. If they have a little encampment going on, then of course, you know, you shouldn't get near it. But other than yeah. that, never had an issue. Yeah, we, we, we have the same issue in Sacramento we, on the American River here. It comes and goes. You just try to keep your distance. And the worst part about it is uh, the garbage down there. Um, yeah. You know, that, that comes along with it. But, you know, you got to do your part when you fish those spots and, you know, take some trash out with you. That's it's good to hear because, yeah, I think I, I think I assume, too, that it might not be a safe place to go fish, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. You think about it like in the movie aspect of it or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Car, car chases and shit and yeah, whatever. So I, what, what's uh, what's the? Oh, sorry. What were you gonna say? Yeah, I was just gonna say. I think all it is is just don't make yourself vulnerable. Just be confident out there. Don't don't act afraid because if there's someone who is opportunistic, they'll pick up on it. Sure. But for the most part, people are minding their own business. You see all kinds of people out there. You see, you know, it's the river goes through a lot of gentrified zones in LA and then a lot of really poor areas too mm -hmm. and a lot of people commute through the LA river with bicycles skateboarding all kinds of things so you see all kinds of people huh, I didn't know that so yeah you can run into some sketchy people but if you're confident if you're doing your thing and just minding your own business I think everything is good yeah it sounds just like being um street smart in any big city yeah so what's the most like surprising thing than that you've seen on the LA River because I've seen some pretty wild stuff on the American River 
here and it doesn't it's not it's a totally different environment surprising as in i don't know weird or funny or like unexpected you know you do find a lot of trash which can be interesting just to see what's out there a lot of shopping carts yeah i found um a couple of like old metal saves you know they just crack them open take everything out of them dump it over yeah. yeah there's one thing that i run into a lot and it kind of bothers me what's that um, a lot of golf balls golf balls a lot of them you're walking across the river and you run into like 10 of them just they're at the bottom people are just uh practicing pitching them into the la river or what i've been told that there's this homeless man that lives under a bridge who does that no oh yeah and, just and one he, guy <laughs> yeah just this one guy that just will shoot <laughs> golf balls and sometimes he'll land pretty close to you but never seen it i've been told but i do know that there's a whole bunch of golf courses along the river huh. so i wouldn't be surprised if a lot of them are just landing into the water just get you know swept down the river it wasn't Could what be. i wasn't what i expected i was thinking yeah. you know remnants of crimes i guess it's like uh safes that could be safes who knows i do find I, I think the last couple of times that i visited the the spot in glendale mm -hmm. the, they call it the glendale narrows there's a lot of trees a lot of vegetation a lot of wildlife in there you do find like used up needles and that yeah, sort of thing find that stuff here too yeah yeah for sure. yeah so i i guess that's an important one to mention you always want to be careful where you're stepping yeah you're not usually waiting i'm assuming are you typically going down there in waders or what yeah i'm always in waders oh you are sometimes okay. sometimes yeah. i'll wet wait but i prefer not to dangerous yeah yeah it's not that bad but yeah. you want to you want to wash up afterwards. Well, I have some more questions related to that. So like I, 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 from the pictures that I've seen and videos I've seen, the mm -hmm. the terrain of the LA River changes pretty drastically too. Um, what's what's access like? Is it, you know, any anywhere you can get that's not on somebody's property? Yeah, it's all it's all public. But I think the, the spot that I fish, it's in the Glendale area. And it's pretty wild there. You can just... There's a bicycle path along the LA River where it starts all the way to where it ends. Is it, is it, all... um, is it concrete lined at that point? Yeah. It's still, yeah. yeah. So it's all fully channelized. But in the Glendale area, if you go down the, the concrete, at the bottom, there's a lot of dirt and rocks Sound, and sand, trees. Yeah, and built up, yeah. yeah. So that's kind of nice. It makes it feel more natural. But I think once you get out of the Glendale area, it just becomes this really narrow concrete channel and there's no fish there. It's just okay. really fast and it just goes all the way to the ocean. So, so so there's a part of it that is just nobody fishes it. There's no point. Yeah, I, I guess most of it. I would say most of I it is just that. like this super narrow. And nobody channel. nobody messes with those. Cause like, so I did an episode on the, the canal system in Phoenix where people are catching tons of carp and stuff like that. Yeah, And, and I see them fishing in... I, I don't know how fast it's moving, but it's that narrow concrete channel like that. And they're mm. fishing in there on the, off the side. Uh, but that's not what anybody does down on the LA river, huh? No. So it's not that deep. It's not that deep, not that wide. I think I know which one you're talking about. In Phoenix. It's pretty famous, right? Everybody goes out there like in the desert. Yeah. 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 It's, it was a bigger deal than I knew until I talked to Chris over at the AZ fly shop on a previous episode. I learned a lot. Yeah. I know the one, the LA river here in, when it meets downtown LA, like near downtown, it doesn't go to the downtown, but when it gets close to the downtown LA and then the industrial area of LA, it's just pretty narrow. It, it's flowing really fast. Uh, it's not that deep. So I don't think any fish can thrive in there. There's not, there's no structure. I don't think there's any food source in there. So most of it is just when you hear people talk about the LA river being channelized, I think that's what they refer Man, interesting. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I figured that the, there was, you know, a lot of, of different places that you could go fish on it and that it's kind of bunched up towards the top of it is what you're saying? Yeah. So where it yeah. begins, that's that's pretty good. It's fairly wild. There's trees growing out of the ground, like in the middle of the river, even though okay. you have these like big walls around you. But then they just kind of like disappear once you get close to a certain area. It mm -hmm. just like funnels into this little narrow spot and it just gushes all the way to the ocean crazy is it open year round like can you fish it all year yeah yeah it's like think of it as a park it's open 24 7 it's accessible cool 
man, that, all yeah, year I, long. I, I have so no idea. Yeah, yeah, the, it's pretty accessible, but you're limited as to where you can fish, where there's actual fish. Uh, so I was lurking your Instagram and I saw, I, you know, I saw that you don't just use a fly rod. You'll throw bait casters and spin rods and stuff, which I totally yeah. dig. I just like fishing. And sometimes one way makes more sense than the other. Right. And, yeah. um, what's, what's something you think that fly anglers can learn by using conventional t tackle? You know, mm, that's a good question because yeah. I, I do believe in like learning from different techniques, you know, yeah. uh, I use a lot of the European style fishing you know they have the alarms really long rods carp's huge over there right yeah, yeah they're yeah. very well respected out there they they care about them so they get pretty big we're talking yeah. like 80 pound carps yeah i've seen some pretty um wacky looking setups like like lures of yours on your instagram i don't know i have no idea what they are but mm -hmm. i can just I look kind of like a piece of corn but at the bottom is like a attachment below it too oh yeah like a piece of corn just hanging off the hook but not yeah the hook is not going through it yeah oh it's below the hook yeah 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 so that's just a different rig that people use for carp in europe usually those techniques work really well for big fish so one thing that i've noticed with carp at least where i've been fishing because i know it varies from lake to lake and all that stuff but i've noticed that usually carp the bigger they are the, the smarter they are and when they're pretty small they're just opportunistic they're fitting in schools and they just want to compete with each other so with the European style, you're kind of going for the big ones. Yeah. And so what, um, you know, we didn't really answer the, the last question yet, but I'm super, I'm super interested about oh, the, like, that, the corn, like, like how it, I'll share the picture of it on the show notes so people can see it, but mm -hmm. um, they might already be familiar. I, I wasn't until I saw it on your, on your page, but yeah. it doesn't make sense for the, like the thing that's supposed to be bait to be underneath where it is. Like, I don't understand why it works and how it works. So the way it works, you have the piece of corn. And it's attached to the bottom of the hook. And then the hook is running to the main line, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the way it works, when it sits at the bottom, the carp will come and like suck it up. And that kind of allows the hook to freely land on their lip. And, and it, most of the time, it, it'll it's, land. It's artificial, right? It's like you're, the, the picture is, is, yes. is like a weight, I'm assuming weighted, right? Yeah. Uh, usually, yeah, usually the hook has enough weight. Okay. to just keep the corn at the bottom. Sometimes the corn will float a little bit, just enough to like move with the water, just mm -hmm. to make it look more natural. The whole purpose of that rig is to allow the hook to move freely. So when the carp picks it up, the hook lands on, their, on the bottom of their mouth. And if once they feel that, because they're very, they're very smart fish, they try to speed it out quick. You want to be fishing with really sharp hooks. They try to speed it out. They speed the, the corn that was hanging off the hook. They speed it out. But the point of the hook is still grabbing onto their lid. Okay. They yeah. freak out. They bolt their heads. And, they turn. and that's when they just take off and you got to okay. set the hook. Yeah. Yeah. Way cool, man. Yeah. yeah. It's just, it's overwhelming sometimes. There's so many techniques. The European people have figured this out a long time ago and they just keep improving. And it's really cool to look at that stuff. But I wish I could apply that into fly fishing. I don't know if I could. It's yeah, totally different. But you do learn that. about behavior. Yeah, I wonder if um yeah, behavior is something. I've asked that question to other folks before and they say the same thing. You're 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 looking at behavior of how fish are um attracted to whatever the lure is doing, which sometimes is different or better on a you know, on a spin rod or something like that that you can learn and apply to to a fly. And I, I wonder if I'm sure somebody's tried it to mimic that same idea of that corn lure with a fly i'm sure it has but there's plenty of stuff that people tie up for carp already like it's all you yeah. know there i mean it's always evolving i'm sure i need to get into it so we have we have a few things in common uh we both you know spent some time in southern california as kids and i think you're a dodger fan too no i am i have my jersey here it's just kind of hard for me to wear it right on man yeah, yeah. um and we, and we both like heavy metal what right. bands are you listening to these days what are you listening to mm. I'm into deathcore. I like deathcore, uh, okay. but I really like the European underground metal or like just Flesh God Apocalypse. Um, I don't know if you know them. I've heard of them. I haven't checked yeah. them out. Yeah, Stuff like that, like really fast. You know what? Now that I'm talking about fast, I love power metal. That's like oh, yeah. my, power metal is one of my main things. Nice. You know, classical metal. Yeah. All that like, kind of stuff. Like what, what bands? Power metal. Um, Stradivarius, they're pretty good. Oh, I uh, heard that. All right. What's the other one? Camelot. And I'm learning about all kinds of different music yeah. from, this, from this show, for sure. 
Uh, this is more of a heavy metal, but I like Epica, Hammerfall. Um, yeah. yeah I, I'm just, if it's metal, I'm there. Yeah. I like all kinds, like deathcore, heavy metal, speed metal. Man, I want to like it all. You know, yeah. uh, when I go to spots and I'm not super familiar with, like by myself, I'll typically pop earbuds in and listen to music and mm -hmm. um, and fish. And lots of times it's heavy stuff too, like Converge or um, Drive Like Jehu uh, was mm -hmm. like a luck, lucky artist for me. I thought I was catching fish when those when I was listening to them a couple of times. Okay. I, thought, I thought it was yeah. lucky and I was like, keep turning it on. Yeah. Um, but I always <laughs> felt like most other, at least fly anglers, I don't know why I didn't, I didn't think they would, um, they'd be listening to music like that while they were out there fishing. And I, I should amend that. Cause actually I just went out with Charlie from axiomatic fly fishing up in uh, near Portland. We went out on the McKenzie and we were listening to Slayer on the boat. So I was totally, you know, totally wrong. You know, another, another thing I saw on your Instagram that you're a, what a self professed craft beer fanatic. Well, I, I, I used to be, I used no, to oh, be yeah, into, okay. in, into craft beer. I, I toned it down a bit. Um, toned it down <laughs> yeah it's you know craft beer i enjoy it i like tasting new things when it comes to beer but you just cannot catch up with it you, you cannot keep up with it you know there's there's so many things to try like at the end of the day you just don't want to drink that much but i i do enjoy craft beer quite a lot actually where i fish in glendale at the river there's a, a brewery where i usually park right in front of it that way after i'm fishing after i'm done yeah. fishing i can just walk over and just have a drink and it's yeah. kind of funny because i've done it where i just walk in with my waiters and i just put my rod on the side and they're like yeah. what's up with this guy <laughs> like it's not halloween yet they're yeah. just looking at me all funny and i'm like oh i was fishing yeah. i'll get a beer i was in the la river guys fishing yeah well yeah. The, a lot of the people out here they don't know that they're fishing there that's so even if even that's... if i tell them they're like are you okay like yeah that's what i'm saying man i don't think many people do i mean that the article that i saw that i mentioned at the very start of the interview was really kind of surprising i mean like i said i i had no idea um you think of the la river as just dried up canals that you mm -hmm. see in the, in the movies or just full of russian water right and yeah um don't think of it as any sort of spot that could look like a uh, natural river which it kind of does in certain spots right and, mm -hmm. yeah. you know so i don't think i don't know i think most people would be surprised they expect you to be yeah. fish, fishing at the beach or uh you know Go up yeah. to the mountain. Go up to the mountains near there. Do you ever you ever head up to the mountains? Oh yeah, trout fishing up there. Yeah, yeah. I love going for trout out here. There's a lot of a lot of streams out here with really small trout, but they're really fun. You go with a two weight glass rod, and you're good all day. Sweet. Yeah. So that's that's fun. There's wild trout in LA, so people don't think about it either, but we have them. You know, another thing that I noticed on your on your Instagram, I saw a picture of you with a uh, Nobel Prize winning theoretical physicist Kip Thorne. Right? Yeah, yeah, I'm surprised you noticed that. Yeah. Well, and I I learned that you're kind of a, of a physics nerd, yeah. Yeah, I like to listen to a lot of that stuff in my free time. So it was kind of a nice thing when I met that guy. You know, we have Caltech here in Pasadena, mm -hmm. so I had a chance to talk to him. He spends most of his time just researching on black holes, which is kind of a big deal now. I think when I posted that, it was barely gaining popularity mm -hmm. back then, but now it's just like everybody's talking about it. So to me personally, it's good for my mind. It just keeps me curious and wondering. Yeah, I was wondering if it gave you any some, some, some kind of secret leg up on the rest of us anglers out there. But... Uh, no, it's funny because I <laughs> talked to him and I asked him, so what's the... like? everybody's in line just waiting for their, their turn to talk to him. And, you know, all these people are like cultic physics students and they're asking like all kinds of things that I don't understand. So I, it's my turn. I talk to him and I'm like, so what's the shape of the universe? And he's like, that's a, that's a really hard question to answer. Like, we don't know. Like, we think it's like a torus or like this and that, but it works. And then he starts like showing me with his hands. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Oh, that's so cool though, dude. And, and the next thing he says, he's like, where are you from? I'm like, I'm from Mexico. And he's like, yeah, I picked up on your accent. My family lives in, in Nayarit. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So your family is neighbors with, with my hometown. So wow. No shit, that's cool. cool. Really cool guy. Really cool guy. I, uh, I mentioned Caltech earlier in this episode on the monologue part of it, because um, I get to talk about all the weird stuff that happened, the weird stuff in LA. Um, mm -hmm. Jack Parsons from Caltech, who's, who helped start JPL, Jet Propulsion Labs, and, um, and Aerojet. Okay. Went to Caltech and the, the group, him and a couple other Caltech students started that up. And things got really weird. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that story. I think I know where you're going. 
Yeah. Are um, you going to the Devil's Gate? Thing, well, or? no, but let's go there. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's the guy. Well, I want to hear what you. I was just talking about because he was super into occult stuff, Jack Parsons. Yeah. And um, well, ended up blowing himself up out there, um, mm -hmm. doing rock, uh, explosives tests, right? And, right. Um, but uh, close had close ties with like L. Ron Hubbard and mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and uh, uh, Aliester Crowley. So I, I just kind of went through a little brief history of that kind of stuff before our interview here. But right. I didn't go near a Devil's Gate. What what is it? What is this? Are we on the same? Are we on the same wavelength there? Same yeah. The same tip? Okay. I, I can tell you what I know. All right. But I don't know if it's for a fact. I don't I don't know much about it. It's just just what I've heard. So I don't know if you've been in the area around JPO. Um, no, I haven't. No. There's a park right right in front of it, uh, and it has a dam. So it's just to control the the water when it just comes down the mountains. They just it's, it's like a basin, like a debris basin, basically. That dam has like a if you go below the dam, that's where the Arroyo Seco goes through. So that's another river. Uh, I think we have some trout there. Or we used to, uh, but anyways, you can go to the to the gate of the dam below it. You can walk into the dam basically. So they call that dam uh, Devil's Gate, and the the rumor is that this guy used to go in there and do like all kinds of like satanic rituals. And okay. what I've heard is that he sold his soul there just to be relevant in the scientific community. Supposedly, mm -hmm. he did some sort of ritual there, and then he became really popular. He became really well known, and that's how JPL came to be. But, yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I, well, I didn't get into that part. I don't know if I've ever. I don't know if I've read that specifically. Um, and now I'm super interested because I know he did tons of ritual stuff, trying to do the Babylon working ritual that was uh, started by Crowley, I believe, long mm -hmm. before he before he did. He was trying to birth what he called the Moon Child. Right. It was like some sort of a. I don't know if Antichrist is the right term for it but it might might be along those lines but right. tons of tons of weird stuff at the start of what ended up being owned by nasa and mm -hmm. um you know being instrumental in all sorts of what space exploration stuff so right i'm not surprised that you uh are familiar being out in pasadena where all that stuff happened yeah it's kind of fun to have that here but yeah i've heard about that i've heard about uh the scientology guy that you just mentioned mm -hmm. um I know there's like some correlation between some of those people. Like one guy bought a house where that other guy used to live in Pasadena. I don't know who was who, but there is also a very specific house in Pasadena where a couple of these people had lived in just because oh, it has really? the history of cold and crazy, crazy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ask uh, the, uh, the physicist, the Nobel prize winner about UFOs at all? Are you into the subject? No. You know what? I ran into a physicist one time in Mount Wilson. So it's an observatory right above Pasadena. I like going there a lot. You can see all the way to the ocean from there, cool. which is really interesting. And I ran into a physicist and his job is to just monitor telescopes, but they're not, they don't use optics. It's all like, like x-rays and just all kinds of like huh. wavelengths and stuff. I, I wouldn't be able to tell you, but yeah. I asked him, so do you guys ever see anything interesting, anything funny? He's like, like, like what, like solar pa patterns or like solar storms, this and that. I'm like, no, like, do you guys ever see like yeah. other kinds of life? And he's just like, no, we don't. We never see anything like that. But he took a couple of seconds to answer that. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I believe in that stuff. Yeah. We can't be alone in this universe. Yeah. Know? It's a really interesting time if you're into the, if you're into that stuff. Let me tell you, there's yeah many different ways you can take it. If kind of there's a way for everybody actually. I mean, if you if you really want to believe in it, you can you can believe in it in so many different ways and think it's some. Everybody has a different idea of what it is. You know? Yeah. All, all I can say about that is that if you talk to a physicist and they don't want to tell you something or whatever they have to say, like. I just like to believe that they don't want to tell you the truth <laughs> yeah. just because they don't have an explanation for oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that looks bad on them. Yeah, yeah I get that. Yeah, that's what so, they're, that's, yeah, that's what, that's what they're there for, right? To provide those concrete answers. Yeah, that's science. Yeah.
Are you so are you into supernatural stuff at all? Have you ever had a paranormal experience or anything weird? Um, paranormal stuff. Other than seeing like random lights hovering above the mountains in in weird ways. Not really. Nothing like ghosts or stuff like that. Not really. More on the logical side. I just believe in it because to me it's really hard to to understand or to believe that we're the only form of life in a universe that just keeps growing and growing. Yeah. It, it's just the logical side of me thinking. So it's you say logical too, and we're just talking about science proving everything, but we haven't figured out a way to prove any of that stuff. And that's that's I think that's like a kind of a we're at kind of a crux there. Because I think mm-hmm. more and more people do kind of believe in that kind of thing. And um paranormal supernatural whatever you whatever you want to call it and Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a way to quantify it really as far as we know yeah but that doesn't stop folks from from believing in it right yeah i I mean i do i want it all to be real man i don't know yeah yeah Mm -hmm. you you know what there's people who believe in it just because they want to have something going on in their lives sure yeah but i feel like i'm not that kind of person just because i doubt everything if i see something that seems weird i I go above and beyond to find out what caused it. Yeah, I love that. So most of the time I'll figure out like, okay, this happened because of that, you know, but the moment you don't have an explanation for it and you do research, you talk to other people, you ask for their opinions and, you know, you do everything you can to, to prove what had happened and you don't get an answer, then that's when it gets interesting. Yeah, I wish more people thought that way. I think I think people are are you know more apt to you know shut something out that they that they don't understand or yeah. or don't you don't want to think is weird or something like that. I think mm-hmm. being open to it, you know, is is key. You know, the whole I mean, you, you talk about the you know the current times of UFOs. Like I think the ideas of aliens and stuff. Like I think the the bottom line thing is that we all want more information right like we want more data and they should be accepting all the weird data and sifting Mm -hmm. through that and finding out what's explainable and what's not and um talking to all the experiencers and uh you know figuring out they're all you know figuring out all these all the more data the better let's figure it out because the government you know you know have admitted that there's something there right Mm -hmm. that they don't know what it is either which i don't i don't believe that they don't know what it is well i think they have an idea just being open to it yeah, and then there's this other thing about that, like, if the government knows that it's there, let's just say it exists, and if it's there, why are they here? Like, what are they getting out of us? Because I like to think that any form of life that can travel to our planet is far beyond our technology and probably resources. So there's really not much they can get out of us. You know? Yeah, wh- why, would they cr- why would they crash here all the time then? Yeah. You know, if they're in something so advanced to get across you know right. space like why yeah. are they cra- why do they crash here yeah and if they're so so advanced we are pretty useless to them in my opinion if they're so so smart if they're so civilized we are we are of no value to them that's just the way i like to see it so it, i just start wondering about these things oh and it just, I, I wonder let me tell you yeah. <laughs> i, I want uh my buddy kyle told me the other night that he worries about me sometimes and i'm just gonna end up some kind of mumbling looney tune and i do <laughs> t- i do too a little bit mm-hmm. but whatever on to on to lighter stuff i always want to talk food with uh my guests and sometimes i don't get to it but what's your um what's your favorite taqueria in la or we or pasadena since that's where you're at favorite one in pasadena uh, there's one just down the street from here, actually. It's on, it's on Fair Oaks in California. I think it's one street over California. That's it's on great... Fair Oaks. It's a taco truck. Mm-hmm. There's two taco trucks in the same on the same block. Okay. But this is, I go this to, is the good one, though. Yeah, the one mm-hmm. I go to is the good one. Don't go to. So there's two. There's the red, the red truck, and okay. then there's the yellow one. So there's like a big discussion about it in pasadena oh, half yeah? the people go to the red one half the people go to the yellow one do they just call them the red and yellow ones yeah yeah oh, they don't even call that, them by their I love, names i love this yeah. so much dude yeah but i think the one i go to it's called la estrella okay which is the most basic name for a taco place like there's like five estrellas here in pasadena <laughs> but yeah the yellow taco truck that's the best spot they stay open till like two in the morning so it's always nice. good yeah hell yeah See, I don't think I have any more questions for you, dude. I think we eat them all up already. 
it's almost been an hour already. We've just mm. been yapping about stuff. It's been cool. You know, yeah. I usually I usually have guides, professional fly tires. I don't even think you really tie flies. And in fact, I wanted I, after after talking to you before the the interview, I want to encourage you to get into it because I you told me that you were a little worried about it being a rabbit hole, mm. another rabbit hole, and it is, but it's a super good one um, because now when you're out there fishing for carp, you can tie up something that nobody else has that works exactly how you want it to work and like you got the secret right i mean like it is it is another rabbit hole but it makes it makes it more fun man i think yeah yeah you know what i think it's time for me to give it a try you should especially because flights are getting really expensive (laughs) yeah they they are expensive and you're not going to save money tying them let me tell you that that's another misconception (laughs) oh really (laughs) yeah you're gonna you're gonna spend money doing it too but it ends up you're like oh i want those i want that i want those feathers i want that fur Mm. i want I want this color that no i need all the colors of that i want all the beads and i want you know it's it's a it is exactly the rabbit hole you're afraid of but I, if i understand just from talking to you for the last 45 minutes you're into carp and you're like and i can see that your brain is like you know going 100 miles an hour trying to figure out what to do and like um, trying to pick apart the scenario and that uh, the equation just gets more fun when you throw tying in your own stuff on it or making your own lures. I see tons of people yeah. making their own lures too, you know, uh, which yeah. is, is just as cool. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's something that I, that I've been thinking about quite a lot recently. And a lot of people ask me, are you tying your own stuff? I'm like, no, all shameful about it. No, <laughs> yeah. but I think it's time for me to get into it. There's no shame, man. I didn't, I put, I did, I did the same exact thing. I, w- I bought the stuff like I bought a vise and, um, you know, materials I thought would be helpful for what, what I wanted to tie. And I like sat in my, in my closet for like a year. Cause I was like, uh, it would seem intimidating just like fly fishing does. You're like, how do I figure out how to learn these crafting moves and, and, you know, yeah. all these little tools I got to buy and I don't know how to use them and stuff. And it seemed super tough and and it, and it isn't. Um, there's you can you you know what you're going to end up tying because you you really end up tying what you use right like yeah. and so it boils down to what five to ten patterns maybe that you end up learning and then you buy the stuff that you use for those and then every once in a while you mess around with stuff because you see something online that looks fun and you start mm-hmm. tying and it gets going from there it's been um cool talking to talking to you that isn't one yeah. of those things not a professional tire not a guide just another angler like me man that like goes out and and fishes and um i've been wanting to pick your brain for a while ever since i saw those pictures you know oh nice yeah no i appreciate that and yeah it's always good to talk to new people i'm always here whenever you're in the area let's go get some carp dude let's do whether whether it's on the fly or european setups whatever it is just yeah man i I got i got family down there still i mean i grew up costa mesa and okay uh, live up here in sacramento now but i go down there often and um i got your cell number now so i'm definitely i'm definitely gonna text yeah. you and i don't want to go catch some carp with you dude, in the la river yeah yeah i might be in northern california at some point later there's, this year so yeah. you can get some carp out there too hit me up dude i'll take you out and go fishing somewhere i don't catch a lot of fish because i'm not very good but we'll have fun you know you might catch them well we'll see i'm not I'm, i don't consider myself that good but <laughs> it's all about the time you put into it yeah for sure and it's fun either way for me man why I do it right thanks again buddy yeah thank you so much for talking to me i i enjoyed this a lot it was pretty fun thanks again for finding time to chat with me fernando i bet next time we talk you'll have succumbed to the urge to jump down the rabbit hole fly tying and will be showing me your own mind-blowing carp bugs that fool the most wily mirror carp on the river also i got great news after our interview i looked up why tilapia are in the la river and i learned from a group called friends of the LA River that the city of LA actually stocked tilapia in the LA River in the 70s with hopes that they would devour the mosquito population. And I would really love tilapia if they succeeded at that. I want to go on a tilapia hunt with Fernando ASAP and I end up in LA for various reasons so we're going to make it happen. I hope he takes me to that yellow taco truck too for some of the best tacos in Pasadena. I'm going to have to do another Southern California episode in the future because there's tons more wild stuff to write about LA and the surrounding areas. I'll make it about fishing the saltwater next time. Maybe I'll try to get Bill Stevenson from The Descendants and Black Flag on the show. He's a fisherman, I think. If the lyrics he wrote to the Descendants song Catalina are true, then he is. Catalina is reported to be a UFO hotspot, too. Okay, I'll get cooking on that. Wish me luck. 
You might hate it, and you probably have some valid reasons why, but I love LA. It's important to me for many reasons. For baseball, for punk rock, and amazing food, especially Mexican food. LA gave me Vin Scully and Black Flag, and I'm forever grateful. I'd be even more spoiled if I liked other sports too, but I've tried, and baseball's the only one for me. It's good to try things you don't think you'll enjoy just in case your mind has changed since the last time you tried. I don't venture outside of my comfort zone enough, and that's good for all of us to do once in a while. Follow synchronicities. There might be some cool water near you that you never thought about fishing. Well, I did it. I managed to go a full episode without referencing Peter Kane. I don't think I reused any samples this time, actually. Ah, the leech. Or maybe that was a lie. I'll probably use those leech samples forever, though. I try my best to keep it fresh. I hope you keep things fresh, too. Project Healing Waters brings a high-quality, full-spectrum fly fishing program to an ever-expanding number of veterans in need at over 200 locations nationwide. Project Healing Waters programs meet regularly throughout the year with volunteers teaching the basics and advanced techniques while building long-term relationships. It's much more than a one-time fly fishing trip. The program provides basic fly fishing, fly casting, fly tying, and rod building classes for participants whose skills range from beginners who have never fished before to those with prior fly fishing and tying experience. All fly fishing and tying equipment is provided to the participants at no cost. Fishing trips, both one day and multi-day, are also provided free of charge to participants. Visit projecthealingwaters.org to learn more. Fishing the good fight is breaking down walls, smashing taboos, and building community. They believe that experiences in nature are an important part of caring for one's mental health. Less than 20% of men struggling with mental illness and or substance abuse are receiving professional support. The combination of a healthy therapeutic outlet, talk therapy, and a strong community will lead to mental well-being. Men face specific challenges when it comes to addressing mental health issues. According to Mental Health America, 6 million men living in the U.S. suffer from depression. In a National Center for Health Statistics studies, nearly 1 in 10 men reported experiencing some form of depression, but less than half sought treatment. 70% of all people who die by suicide are men. It's from the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Men are often reluctant to seek help, particularly for depression, and are far less likely to access professional mental health services than women. Men make up less than 25% of people treated for depression and or substance abuse. For a lot of men, Fishing the Good Fight program, such as a retreat, is the first time they have opened up about the struggles they faced, and 100% of men who attended a recent retreat indicated that they would seek professional help after the treatment. If you've ever wondered about your own mental health and wanted to improve your quality of life, Fishing the Good Fight can provide the tools, resources, and support to guide you along your wellness journey. Fishingthegoodfight.org has more information. May God give you for every storm a rainbow, for every tear a smile, for every care a promise, and a blessing in each trial. For every problem life seems a faithful friend to share, for every sigh a sweet song and an answer for each prayer. This episode of the Secret Society of Fly Tires is brought to you by Scientific Anglers. There's a group of learned gentlemen who love fly fishing. They also love books and science and numbers and stuff. Their brains are wet with knowledge. Their rods are bent with the weight of the three pound brown trout that they are constantly hauling in. They are generous. They are geniuses. They get together once every three weeks and go fishing together. These are the Scientific Anglers. Do you think you've got what it takes to join their exclusive club? Well, let me tell you right now. You don't. You're too dumb and too bad at science and fishing, so don't even try, okay? This episode of The Secret Society of Fly Tires is brought to you by Megadeth. I used to think that Dave Mustaine's name was Dave Mustang, like Mustang, and if he was smart, he would change it to that. I just looked at a picture of him and he looks like a road-killed lizard these days, but he's got more money than I'll ever see in my whole life put together, so who am I to judge? That song Sweating Bullets is a good one. I don't think I could name another Megadeth song right now, but why don't you go ahead and listen to that song? They sponsored this episode and part of the agreement is that we would direct listeners to their music, so that's what I'm doing. Go listen to Sweating Bullets by the rock and roll band Megadeth on your CD or cassette player today. Please note that this is not a real advertisement, and the company, brand, entity, or product mentioned in the preceding ad in no way endorses, agrees with, or knows about this podcast.
Hello, me. Meet the real me. And my misfits way of life. The dark black past is my most valued possession. Hindsight is always 2020, but looking back, it's still a bit fuzzy. You speak of mutually assured destruction. Nice story, Tata Reader's Digest!